Welcome to the School District of Waukesha's Board of Education Teaching and Learning Committee meeting for Tuesday, April 6, 2021. Uh, we start our agenda under general business, uh, verifying that the meeting has been properly posted. Uh, Stacy, has it been? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, now is the time and the opportunity for our public um, to comment or uh, address the board. Stacy, do we have anyone this evening? No, we don't. Okay, thank you. And no bright lights this evening. Uh, we move into our action items. Uh, approval of the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting minutes for March 2nd, 2021. I move approval. Thank you, Mr. Como. Seconded. Thank you, Mr. Baumgard. Any further discussion? Questions, additions, deletions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Passes, Stacy. 5-0. Next night, we're looking at uh, the approval of some overnight field trip requests. We have um, from South High School Cheerleading Nationals that will take place um, February 2022, South High School Band Choir and Orchestra, Disney Workshops in Orlando, Florida, March 18th through the 23rd, 2022. So we have, hi Sarah, welcome. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, Sarah, I'll just briefly go over the cheerleading nationals, pretty self-explanatory, but she, we always bring the chaperones now to help answer questions for the board members as necessary, so. Sounds good, welcome. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we are requesting to go to nationals this next year. It'll be 2022. Um, the trip is typically in February. In order to get to nationals, we do have to qualify for it, which happens in December of this upcoming year. Um, based on the past few years, we won state the last two years for Chile at South, which is just amazing where we've come from having six or seven girls to now we have about 60 in our program. Um, so we were able to win state again this year, the, the state they had, which was a little bit more unique. Um, but we feel that this next year, we are absolutely ready to go to a nationals experience and make a run um, run at it, which is amazing. Um, so hoping for approval again this year, knowing we had to cancel this last year, they're really good about, we don't schedule things until we know for sure it's gonna happen. Um, once it's confirmed and once we hopefully qualify in December, we would then schedule out going in February. Any questions? Mr. Baumgart. Uh, I don't know if it's a question so much as I just want to be reassured that in the event that we have continued pandemic problems, we are protected financially. Absolutely, yes. It was the first year they ever had to do anything like this, so they were really great about it. They didn't have any kind of commitment, no lost fees, anything like that. So we were approved for this last year. We Everything was refunded. It had no issues at all. So we're in yeah. good shape for that. Yeah. And I, I didn't hear, when is the next... You have one more competition to get there? So, yeah, we would qualify in December of um, 2021. So this upcoming December, we would compete um, at the regional level. It's usually Milwaukee um, for a nationals bid. And then if we get that bid, we would then go in February. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Looking for a motion? Mr. Baumgart? Uh, I move for approval. I gotta get the right one. Uh, approval of the overnight trip to Orlando for the Cheerleading Nationals competition. Second. Mr. Roddy, second. Thank you. Any further discussion, questions? Mr. O'Brien? So, I just because I'm didn't catch it the first time. How many students did you say was currently in the program? So I think we have about 60 in our program, probably closer to 80 with our youth teams now. Um, we'd be taking around 20-ish tops. <laughs> We're not gonna take 60 students to nationals. That'd be kind of kind of awful. Um, so yeah, hopefully 20-ish would be going. Um, we're gonna do a tryout. We actually have tryouts in two weeks from now to start selecting teams, but there's very specific requirements of different skill levels and, and things like that in order to go. So roughly 20 would be going to the Nationals experience, but our program has really grown significantly in the last 11 years I've been a part of it. So what's the uh, co-ed mix? 
Um, right now we have, we, this last year we competed with one male on varsity um, and won the co-ed state. Um, the year before that we had one, the previous two years about two guys typically. So two to three, and usually the majority are females. Are you looking for more? Not that I'm trying to join, but. <laughs> We're always looking for coaches too, yeah. No, absolutely. And we are, we are doing pretty heavy recruitment right now as well, so. <laughs> Beaver's thinking about it. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> right. Always looking for coaches as well, too. <laughs> Board members can't make workers' comp claims. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any further discussion questions? Okay, everyone. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Pass to Stacy five zero. Thank you so much. Have a good night. <laughs> Next, we have a South High School band, choir, and orchestra trip. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Travia, and I'm the choir director at Waukesha South. And behind me are my colleagues, Abby Mazza, the band director, and Courtney Gildersleeve, the orchestra director. And uh, we would very much like to take a department trip to Florida next spring break, 2022. It's almost a mirror image of the trip that Abby and I took with the students in, when was that? 2018. 2018, so uh, three and a half years ago. Um, we would travel down by bus, we would not need to miss any days of school. Uh, the trip would include, the, the highlight of the trip would include uh, a workshop where we would work with um, professionals in the music industry who work for Disney and uh, participate in a recording session with them. Uh, all three of us have done that activity in the past. And uh, when we've done that with students, they have talked about that that was even better than going on Space Mall. Yeah. <laughs> they, they absolutely loved that experience. It really was a special experience. Really, really well done. Um, some of us are a little disappointed that, I'm disappointed, but understandably so, that uh, trips over the last year, year and a half have had to be canceled. Um, I was supposed to take my students to New York in June. And so, um, of course, that got canceled and refunded. So we are hoping to try to still give students an opportunity to do some traveling and see the country and experience something that they cannot experience here. Mr. Baumgart. Uh, yeah, question. I, I understand this is not a competition. No. Correct. But do you have to get invited to come or you just make an application to go? You make an application to go through the Disney workshops and then they look at your application and approve that. Oh, okay, so that does require their approval for, for you to participate. Correct. Thank you, that's what I was asking. <clears throat> Mr. Como. Yeah, um, sometimes we're uh, afforded uh, a rough schedule of things that you're, you're doing and I'm not finding that. Can you give... Mm -hmm. um, uh, some sense of what that is? Yes, there was an itinerary. I think I linked in there. Um, but our itinerary would be to leave on March 18th and to travel down there. And then we would, <clears throat> excuse me, spend four days in Orlando, one of those days including our, our workshop experience, and then traveling back. So travel, travel is by, transportation is by bus, I take Correct, it. yes, we would travel through the night. It takes about 26 hours. So how many students do you anticipate? Oh, we yeah. anticipate 80 students and then approximately 10 chaperones. Okay, in terms of the groups and how the split works out between the three groups? As far as, as, far as choir versus band versus orchestra, who's asking? It will, we're basing it on, um, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, availability. We're gonna we're gonna offer it to 80 students, and then if it goes beyond that, we just have to make sure that we have the correct number of students to hit our price point. Um, typically, in the past, that has been roughly where we have the students come from. So, um, one of the questions that we've had over the years is, you know, a um, long time ago we started uh, reducing 
reducing our uh, programs way back in the early years, and that seemed to affect the band and orchestra program. Have we seen it? And yet we've tried to improve that. Have we seen an improvement from what it was maybe at our low levels? Are you asking us what our numbers are like compared to four or five years ago? <laughs> yes. Is that, um, yes, because how, we had... How, we had how honest do you want us to be? <laughs> they, are, they are going down. They are still I going feel down. like trips like this are something that help build community and build the retention and those numbers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you should be honest. Mm -hmm. I ask tough questions, so. Mr. Como. Yeah, going back to my original question, I'm trying to get a sense of how much time are the workshops? How many are there? It's 90 minutes. Get, you know, is it across it's three days? Is it? The workshop you know, is a half a day. It, it, the whole workshop is about two and a half hours, so that will lead up an entire morning or an entire afternoon. Okay, and the workshop includes the recording session? Correct, yes. It's all, it's all um, uh, should we you want to describe? So, yeah, yeah. the students, um, they go into what is called a live recording studio where actual Disney musicians and recording artists go into, and they get to... Um, rehearse and um, learn from a Disney conductor. They teach the kids um, music from the movies and they teach them um, how to, how it's, how it's recorded. They talk about the sound engineering component. Um, they get to hear all like the, the words like take, um, cut off. Um, they learn about click tracks. And then once they rehearse it with um, the conductor, then they actually set it to film. And then that film, they get to take it home and keep it for a keepsake. Um, the last time I did it, gosh, that's when we took the whole um, district to Disney World. Um, the kids were playing it nonstop on the bus on the way home. I mean, it was that infectious of, I mean, I think it's better than playing on a Disney stage somewhere for, you know, uh, people walking by. It's, it's so much more effective. I, I can tell you right now, I did have one student when we were done, he was in tears and he said, Mrs. Gildersleeve, thank you so much for allowing me to have this opportunity. It was the coolest experience. And I had perma smile the whole time <laughs> while the clinic was going on. So I can assure you it is high quality and it's something that is, you know, what they can experience with technology today. Anything else? Anything further? Emotion. Mr. Como. I move approval of the Disney Performing Arts uh, Recording Workshop down in Orlando, Florida uh, in March 18th, 2022 through March 23rd, 2022. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Mr. Baumgart. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Pass the Stacy 5-0. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Or you do a great job. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Hey, next this evening, we're moving into discussion information items. Uh, we have integrated math one and two course syllabi. Our presenters uh, this evening are Rachel Herman, our director of secondary learning, and Dan Kochinski, one of our math instructional coaches. Welcome to both of you. And I guess we have some other guests here that they can introduce. So, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, I couldn't think of any better way to start the end of this school year than today. Because uh, I'm really excited. I say that with a little bit of sincerity and a little bit of humor. Because the team of people that came together to get to this point, you've heard all about it, but there's been another new team that's got us to this point. So the work that you see in front of you are four different UBDs that have been developed by a team of 14 different teachers from across all of our secondary schools. So over the last month and a half, we've met many nights to really collaboratively come up with what we want Math 1 and Math 2 to be for our dual language program and for our regular Math 1 and Math 2 program. Um, to here to talk about it is going to be Adam McDonald from South and Hillary Kennel from Butler, and also Leslie Waltz, who is our dual language coach. And of course, Rachel Herman. So the major point that I want to put out to you, is, project out to you, is that the process that we took was a collaborative one. Once again, building another layer of accountability for our teachers, 
and another layer of investment for them in building the program that they want to see for their math students. And um, it's exciting. It may not look like it on those few sheets of paper, but it is to me. <laughs> Adam? Um, thanks for having us today. Uh, I just want to talk about the top-down approach and what that really looks for in that process is it wasn't just Dan and Rachel telling us what to do. It was us coming together collaboratively and then talking about our big ideas. Um, and that second page, the enduring understandings. Um, what do we want kids to know and be able to do when they start leaving high school? What are some of those big ideas? As we look at those essential questions, then how can we tackle and get to those? And so as we look a little bit further and we dive into, okay, what's that start to look like? And how can we get to some of those 21st century skills? Um, you know, and really collaboratively looking at all the different things. A lot of us piloted it. And here's how, what we saw and how we can apply it then to a lot of those learning targets. Um, Hillary's going to talk a little bit about um, once we kind of looked at those essential questions, how do we get to some of those specific I cans in those learning targets? Um, and so when we were working as a group, we kind of ended the process by making sure that those specific learning targets and those I can statements that we had come up with for Math 1 and Math 2 correlate it to our standards that we need to meet. So with the state standards, um, we cross-referenced ours to the state standards and then back from state standards to our standards to make sure that nothing with, nothing's missed in those first two years of high school math. Um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of work and a lot of, like, like she said, cross-checking back and forth to ensure that we're meeting everything, we're covering everything that our kids need to understand to do after their first two years of eighth grade math. Um, this theme of alignment and working together is, is really, really critical for us. As you see, there are four different UBDs. That's probably not normal to have presented four different courses at the same time. But we're looking as, at math one and math two as one course, one experience over two years. And that's why we took that approach with our staff and teachers to really ensure that the first two years after eighth grade mathematics would be really succinct and really connected. Do you have any questions about our process or the product that you see in front of you? Dan, how long has the process been going on? Well, <laughs> the process of writing the syllabus and UBDs has gone on for the last two months. But the process of coming to this point, selecting our curricular resources, really mapping out our vision and our, our thought for how we want high school mathematics to be for our students has taken well over two and a half years to get to this point. Mr. O'Brien. Yeah, I, I just want to comment on the challenge of trying to follow through on this with all the other workload you had this year. Um, I don't think people understand the workload that educators went through this year. I mean, it was, it was uh, almost unbearable for a lot of educators. And that you're able to continue to move this along while you're trying to manage through this strange period. Um, I, I, just, I just think it's phenomenal that you guys have been able, I would have actually said, set this aside for a while because it was just because I know how much work has been this year for our educational staff. And so I'm glad you moved forward with it, but I also want to recognize for all the staff, not just for you, what a rough, rough year this has been trying to manage face to face, hybrid, and every other, you know, virtual, everything in between, and, and still trying to move forward the curriculum aspect of it that we worked so hard on in the math program. So, Mr. Baumgard. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that, uh, compliments about what you've gotten done over a short and difficult period of time, uh, very important. Uh, work, as, as Kurt said, we might, might have had to put it to the side for a while, but we didn't. And, and, I, and I had a little bit of a flash when I was hearing you talk, and I know you've had to incorporate a number of other people into this. Uh, I have no idea the size of the magnitude of that, but... Purely by coincidence, Dr. Siebert and I were talking in the parking lot this morning and about one of the wonderful things about this, this district is the collaboration we've been able to form in teams to get things done. And, and you are evidence of that kind of work. Uh, the fact that it wasn't just one or two of you that thought we we're going to get this done. 
it was probably a large group of people. And, and the interesting thing, and I've known this, and, and uh, Dr. Siebert figured it out, that's what we do in the school district of Waukesha. Uh, and we should be proud of that. And you are an evidence, again, of, of that happening. So thank you for that. Thank you. Mr. Como. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, so what we're teaching currently today versus what we're hopefully going to be teaching in the future. Can you give us some of the biggest differences, whether that is the enduring understandings have really shifted, um, or you know, there's topics that we haven't been covering now, we're going to be covering, and you've kind of combined these into a couple of years. So just some of those big, what are the big differences? Between um, what we have now and what we will have. Sure. I think Mr. Baumgartner mentioned it a couple of years or a couple of meetings ago. Two plus two is still going to be four. So that's, <laughs> that's always going to be the case. Thank you. Um, a lot of the good concepts are still going to be there. Um, a lot of times in Algebra 1 currently we have linear things and then nonlinear things, quadratic things, second semester. Sometimes our kids get to that point and they're just not ready for it. And a lot of things in Math 1 are linear in nature. So it's going to go from geometry, it's really going to intertwine everything together in that linear nature and go from one topic to the next. Having some sort of story problem that you can always go back on. Um, in one of the units that we piloted, it talked about area and perimeter, and we could always go back to doing polynomials. Hey, remember when we found the area of that bedroom? Oh yeah, I remember that. Okay, we need to lay carpet in there. Here's what that carpet comes into. So it was that common theme week after, and you're just like, oh my gosh, we're doing the same thing again? Yep. Here it is again, and it's just, the kids were really good at it. Um, I thought it was really good. As they get to year two in math two, things become quadratic, and it seems to be that common theme then throughout the whole year. So linear kind of first year, math two kind of quadratic in that second year. Mr. O'Brien. So you actually teach two plus two x equals four, where x equals one, is that correct? We're gonna do that. Yeah. <laughs> That was the dance for Mr. Baumgart. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm wondering um, overall, have we pretty much stayed in as we anticipated when we went down this path? I think it was about a year ago when it was talking about the scope and sequence through the various grades. Has it continued pretty much in that way? Have we been able to manage our way through that? Yeah, we're still going to math one next year. Things are still right on track. Math two the following year. And then we're still getting into the process of what those electives are going to look like as we get to that third and fourth year. Can I, I want to add, um, sure. we also recently launched our math implementation team. So to Mr. Baumgart's point of just building continued capacity amongst various stakeholders, um, even though Adam, for example, serves on our integrated math one team, He's not on that math implementation team. We have different stakeholders on that to continue to just grow capacity. That math implementation team is charged with looking at our overall vision for what this looks like big picture and ensuring that we are continuing to take steps in the right direction. Most, re most recently, we established what we're calling our metrics of success. So right, this is a huge investment. This is a huge pivot. This is a huge shift in our instructional practice. How will we know that it's working? And so we're super excited once we get that tightened up to come and present that to you as a, right, how will we know that this is impacting student achievement? Anything else? Ms. Roddy. Yes, thank you. Um, what is the timeline from here going forward? Um, how much more work is to be done before it's, you know, ready? Can I take it? <laughs> Dan's going to be really busy yeah. with middle school next what are, year. Yeah, what are the next steps? <laughs> uh, the, for the high school work moving forward, what we're looking at is starting really tomorrow, we're going to be connecting with our Math 1 implementation team again, building out um, more common assessments, really getting teachers trained and make, ensuring that we're providing them enough proper PD for them to shift their pedagogical, pedagogical understanding of how we want to do math in Waukesha. And the next step after that, you know, starting next fall, will be, all right, now we need to do that with math two. 
And um, with the whole change in our structure, right along to go with that, we'll be working with another team to start launching what Math 3 will look like. Um, we're continuing to use the same resource, so that won't be uh, heavy lifting for us, but it'll just be coming back to the table with what is Math 3 gonna look like? And then after that, we're gonna be looking at um, we're, we're just going to make our pathways for kids to get to their electives that they want. Thank you. Mr. Bryan. So to help me understand the pace of math, because you know, I'm 45 years from it, okay. If, if uh, at what grade level um, for the, the slightly advanced student, I mean, it wouldn't be basic math, would they be picking up on the concept of two plus two x squared equals four? At what grade level would that happen today in our school? Did you ask if, the, if for an, an accelerated math? Well, at what grade level would that be oh. um, included in the curriculum for two plus two x squared equal four? At what grade would that be a sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, or ninth grade type question? Uh, typically that would be going from seventh grade into eighth grade because okay. they're not really solving or looking at quadratic models at that point. Okay. But uh, yeah, that would be typically seventh grade or eighth grade work. Okay. Working Thanks. with expressions and equations. Mr. Baumgart. I don't want Leslie to just sit there with nothing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> Leslie, I do have a question because I know that in one of the previous meetings we were dealing with how we are going to communicate some of this information into the Hispanic community. Can you just add on to that for us? Um, so our students have been part of a dual language program. They are enrolling into, right now, geometry in Spanish. Okay. That has been a course that has been going on for one year at Waukesha North and for three years at Waukesha South. And so this has, it, it's not, um, the big change is the same as for all the other students, where they're going to go into an integrated model for the students that are just joining Integrated Math 1 will now be in Spanish. So all the communication, I believe that when we were presenting to the high schools, was also done for our Hispanic community. I think Natalia was available for translation, and we will continue to do, to do that. So let's move it along fine. Thank you. You bet. Mr. Bryan. Maybe Ms. Landish can help me with this, but our dual language program has been kind of fully launched for, has it been 10 years now or roughly? I, I can tell you, our dual language two-way program, our oldest students are juniors this year. Yeah, that's, that's they what are I was... at, uh, they're at South, they will be, uh, they will be seniors next year. Uh, Mr. Baumgart and I went to see them when they were freshmen. Uh, my son is in the second class, so he's a junior, uh, he's a sophomore this year. So we're about to graduate. Next year we will be graduating our first class. So we're going to be able to soon see the finished product of this long path through du dual language. Yes. How's it going? I think it's wonderful. Okay. As a mother of two students in the program, a future ninth grader and a tenth grader, I think it's wonderful. They're fully bilingual and biliterate, and I really can only thank the district because I didn't do a very good job of speaking Spanish to my own kids because it's hard, right? It's really hard. So, yeah, it's wonderful. So we, um, over the course of time, we take a look at our curriculum and we, we have it on a rotational basis as to what, what we're going to look at and what we need to revisit. And you guys have spent a couple of years on this as we were talking. If you were to take a big step back and, and, and this, you guys are in the details. I, I, maybe this is hard, maybe it isn't. Maybe this is just quick and easy for you. But if you were to express to the people who are listening on television, could you summarize what makes this better than what we currently have? Sure, I can do that. <laughs> um, I think it's going to be more engagement. More engagement with teachers, more engagement with students. Um, typical, you know, we've done a lot of different strategies with AVID and how to get kids in groups and collaborative. This model is all about collaboration. And so, as we pilot some of these things, it's really been difficult to come up with ways to do collaboration. Okay, you sit over there, I sit here, we kind of show each other our whiteboard and collaborate that way. I'm really excited to get kids in groups talking math, um, doing all those things. A lot of times when we talked about all those different average strategies, we'd always get to writing. We'd be like, writing in math? Serious? 
they just do the problem. Well, no, this is about explain your reasoning, what you're thinking, and write it down. Um, reading. There's a lot of story problems we're going to have to read. And not just that, but then what's that process and doing that tweaking of things. And so I'm really excited to, to conquer all of those things inside Wicker with the so kids. We, we know engagement's important. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Let our audience know. Say it again. Why is, enga why is engagement important? I'd look, love the kids to be even more successful in math than they currently are. Mm -hmm. I think the more that they're engaged, the more that successful they're going to be in class. Um, they're going to enjoy coming to math class versus, boy, how many was math your favorite subject? No, it's okay. I like to raise it a little bit. You know, that's what I always say in class. I'd like you to, you know, maybe it's not your favorite class, but I'd like to raise it a little bit. And hopefully that enjoyment that they see that we have as educators, that they can leave and, and have that math experience be just a little bit better yep. than maybe and, when they had it at the start. And I don't mean to ask simple questions. I know you guys know why engagement's important. That's not why I ask the question. It's to let the people in the audience know that this, is, this, is, this method of learning is something that's going to hopefully last a long time with the students, maybe even open up some doors in some areas that they may not have thought that they were ever interested in or even existed. And it could actually change their lives and what they choose to do uh, in college or as a professional. And you guys know that. <laughs> Not that you don't know that. Um, it, it just is, it's so important to get our kids engaged because it sticks with them, you know, in some manner is what our hope is. And uh, I know you guys know that. I just want, we talked a lot about engagement, I don't know, a year ago, as, as, a, big, make, as a big difference maker. And um, it is important, and I wanted that to, come out again tonight to just kind of keep that that 30,000 foot point of view why are we doing this I appreciate it anything else Mr. Baumgart to add to Joe's question is it another answer that this isn't only us that's come along with this the, the schools the colleges the universities are all now believing that this is the right route to follow and we need to be on the same train so I, I certainly agree with the fact that engagement is a huge piece of what we get out to add to education, but the reality of the situation is we've got to move on anyway. So I'm just adding that point. And we, we will plan to come back. It is um, in an updated meeting where we will showcase to you our four foundational whys, like the why behind this work. And then again, connected to that are our metrics of how we're going to ensure that we're moving forward with all of those. So Adam referenced the engagement. There's also an equity piece. There's a mathematical mindset piece. So um, we have that work and we're really excited to again, finalize that and present that to you. Good. Anything else? Obviously you've done a very thorough job, very dedicated individuals that I see in front of me, um, very committed to the work that you're doing and it shows. Um, and I have no doubt that uh, the implementation is going to be successful. And as a board, we look forward to uh, future updates as um, they become available. So thank you very much for taking time out of your day and thank you for your enthusiasm and commitment leadership. We appreciate it. Thanks. Next this evening, we have um, elementary and secondary social studies uh, update. Um, uh, Rachel here. Yeah, I think we're. Um, Let's do an order of your speaking first, right? Yeah, gotcha. Rachel, you want to introduce? Uh, yeah, there's a whole crew coming, though. Okay, so that's I fine. I think I'm going to line them up in order of how they're speaking. Yeah, that's great. Um, since there's only two microphones. They can introduce themselves. We'll go in elementary and secondary social studies update. Four, because there's like six more people coming. Do it. Order of how they're speaking, Dee. That's why I took this spot. <laughs> Just, I was figuring. Who's going second after Mark? After Mark. 
Or come Stephanie. Stephanie. Stephanie and Dadia. Dadia. Where did all these people come from? Welcome to all of you, and we look forward to your presentation this evening. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, hello, everybody, again. Um, so we're here tonight with a crew. We've got an elementary crew and a secondary crew here to give you an update around the social studies curricular revision that's taking place, uh, K-12. So from a secondary um, team perspective, we have Mark Anderson, who is a history teacher at Waukesha West. We have Jessica Natter, who is at Butler Middle School, and Brianna Beadle, who is at Horney Middle School. And I'm going to let Dee introduce the elementary folks. So as we're all aware, we had our first elementary pilot last month, and we've brought together tonight a few of our teachers that did do the pilot to share their um, experience with you. First off is Stephanie Beck and Jadia Kirk. They're both from Hawthorne Elementary School. We have Sarah Eckert, who has been teaching virtually with SDW Virtual, second grade. And then we've got Lucia Torres, who is a fifth grade dual language teacher at Bethesda, and Hadassah Robinson, who is a bilingual special education teacher who's been co-teaching with her. So let's get started. Uh, hello, as uh, Ms. Herman said, I'm Mark Anderson from Waukesha West High School. Um, I put together just a tiny little flow chart here to introduce what our team has, has been working on and to piggyback off of what uh, my math colleague was talking about just to end um, their session where they were talking about wanting to increase engagement in mathematics. Our goal is no different. Our goal is to increase engagement throughout social studies and have a quality curriculum. Now, I put on there that it revolves around the idea that our curriculum could revolve around compelling questions, as opposed to the traditional model, the older model of, I am the teacher who knows the things. You sit there, I'm going to tell you the things. And that's what compelling questions attempt to do. So our first step has been reading the book, The Inquiry Design Model, and discussing that, and trying to identify how can teachers help students ask their own compelling questions, and how can teachers learn to ask quality compelling questions as well. And we spent a good amount of time talking about that and trying to make sure that the same sorts of questions are not asked all of the time, and that questions go beyond a surface level. And that kind of leads me into my step number four there, which says create classes that allow students to reflect upon multiple perspectives of historical events or current events. Kind of identifying what they think they know, what they have learned, and what other people think they know. And, uh, and then I think the hard part, and one of the hardest parts of this idea is going to be step number five, locating sources for both students and teachers to use. That question of how to find our sources is always very challenging. What sources are appropriate? What sources are the correct reading level? What sources will engage students? And that's kind of a step that we're starting to transition to. And then ultimately, we're going to have to decide a scope and sequence. And hopefully, that will be instead of just saying, hey, in seventh grade, you teach this list of facts. And in eighth grade, you teach this list of facts. We have an idea of these are the compelling questions we would like students to be able to discuss. These are the compelling questions we would like people to be able to debate. And I have an example on there, because I think sometimes when people say compelling questions, they immediately think that I must be talking about like the world's most hot button issues that we're going to be debating and fighting all of the time, and that we're going to have you know, chaos, or that we're going to be promoting some point of view. But in all actuality, a good compelling question is based on the standards. In all actuality, a good compelling question doesn't even have to be a hot button issue. I used the one that I have up there right now as the example. Was the creation of agriculture good for society? Now you take a bunch of high schoolers and you tell them, today we're learning about agriculture. It does not immediately lead to engagement. They don't say, yes, <laughs> tell me how food is produced and why I care. But when we, when we phrased it with the idea of was the creation of agriculture good for society, we ended up having a very nice conversation where students were utilizing evidence from multiple sources for a discussion. And that's the route that we are looking to go, and that's what a bunch of us are going to be talking about um, tonight. 
So I told Rachel I'd keep it to two minutes, so I hope that. Perfect. <laughs> Something about you. Hi. Okay, um, so I'm, again, Stephanie Beck. I'm from Hawthorne Elementary, and I teach fourth and fifth grade. And so in our piloted curriculum, I'm going to talk a little bit about what compelling questions looked like at the elementary level. Um, the curriculum sets out these compelling questions, and like he said, they're debatable. They get kids thinking about issues, and they're interdisciplinary, and in that kids have to look at sources that weave together history or politics um, or geography. And so our sample fifth grade question is up there for you. Ours was, did the age of exploration cause more harm or good? And so prior to this compelling question, as we're working through the unit, kids are looking at different primary and secondary sources and gathering evidence that can ultimately lead them to answer this question. And because it's debatable, they're considering different perspectives and trying to weave together all of these sources to come up with an answer. I had a video clip for you, but I'm hearing that the sound isn't working for it which is a big bummer. Um, so in the video, we can try to play it because there are just some captions there that is um, a caption to what the scholars are saying in the video. But you'll see that prior to this, um, the kids had been asked to choose harm or good. And so you'll see two parallel lines. They're seated across from one another in the classroom. And one side chose more harm, and the other side chose more good. And the source that they had just looked at, they had each um, researched one European explorer and the impact of their exploration. And so that kind of was their source that guided them in their first choice, their first attempt at this compelling question. And there's an open dialogue, back and forth kind of debate style as they're talking through their evidence. Yeah, try it. I can kind of narrate too. So one of the ladies on the left side here is talking first, and she's on the side of harm. And so the first thing she said is, well, claiming land is actually just stealing from Native Americans that were already there. And then she references her explorer, Coronado, who specifically killed Native Americans in his pursuit for gold. And then uh, Gavin, I wish you could hear him. He's saying, I agree with Maddie. What was going through their heads? This is not right. He really does sound like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and then Eve, who's also on the side of harm, she then piggybacks off of what Maddie had said. And she references her explorer, who is Cortez. The caption is about to come up. And she makes two evidence statements here. She says, Cortez, his, his people spread disease throughout the native population. And then she also said there was a very large war that occurred between the Europeans and the Native Americans. And then we have a response from the other side of the room. So Logan here says, I have to respectfully disagree. He said some explorers were actually just trying to make peace with Native Americans, and if they were coming there and creating settlements, then they were sharing land and actually creating a society of blended people, is what he said. He kind of goes into that, and he um, also references a couple of impacts, such as updating maps, and then he specifically references his explorer, who is Cartier. Here it comes. And he said he just wanted to get find riches for his king, so he was just trying to do his job. And that's the clip. <laughs> I apologize that you couldn't hear them. <laughs> it would have been better. <laughs> with the words. 
respectfully. You know, they're really well trained in their language workshop to use these kind of rebuttal arguments, and it's, you, can, you couldn't hear it, but you can see that they don't raise their hands. They are waiting for that cue and kind of trying to have this collegial discussion. So they're set up well in their literacy to do this kind of thing in our social studies. In that type of discussion, do you ever have students that switch sides? Um, in this one, we didn't, um, but Eve did say um, the second girl that spoke on the side of harm, if you could have heard her, she said, I'm kind of thinking both, but I'm leaning more towards, so they are kind of on the fence, and that's the beautiful thing of a compelling question is they're debatable. Kids should be finding evidence on both sides, and ultimately they just have to make a claim and have evidence to back it up. Um, so in the middle school level, we are still looking, we just finished reading the book and going through and looking at these compelling questions, supporting questions and tasks to get into actually starting to write them. Um, so a supporting question, the compelling question is at the top there, is compromise always fair? And I picked an example from US history because that is what I am currently most comfortable with. Um, supporting questions are questions that lead to, in a logical manner, um, finding that knowledge that you need to have that discussion at the end or that argument at the end. Um, it's the content. It keeps your inquiry very focused. So we're not going off on 100 different tangents. We're really focused on answering that one big question. In this case, there was a supporting question that talks about how was representation determined under the Articles of Confederation? Very content-heavy question. And then each supporting question is supported with a task or a performance task. These tasks will build on each other as you learn more about what your compelling question is, as you gather that ev evidence, um, to create that final argument. They focus on key verbs. The examples here are all writing-based, so writing a summary, writing a summary, and then eventually writing that claim with evidence. Um, but they are not simply just writing. Things like defining, listing, annotating, making timelines, creating charts are all also examples of performance tasks that would go as formative checks for each of those supporting questions. Um, sorry. Uh, so in second grade, in the virtual world, we relied, I relied heavily on SmartSuite or Hello Smart, if you've heard of that, um, to engage the students and help them use the resource that we had available and also connect it to their own community. In second grade, our compelling question was, how does geography affect our community? And we used the sources of um, videos, of matching, and of reading that were provided to us, and those were transferred into Smart Suite, and you can see some of the student examples of their home community. They drew maps um, and made a key of their community and the things around their community, and then um, we built off of that, and I'm not sure if the video has sound. You can try it. Um, but this is one student's answer to the compelling question of how does geography affect our community. How geography affects our community is it changes it over time. And when we build houses, we change the layout of our community. So students shared that on Flipgrid and they responded to one another about what they said and how they felt geography affected the community. Um, not sure who's next. So the end result then is our summative performance task. So as students have been introduced to this compelling question, they've gone through the formative tasks, and then and they've been introduced to good quality sources, and now we have our final summative performance task, which is you know using evidence-based argumentation to answer that compelling question. And this is done through you know any sort of like 
you know, essay, a presentation, slides, posters. Um, and I really liked this quote from the book that we did. It said, we believe that developing the skill of argumentation is the most important contribution of a strong social studies education. Argumentation is what we do as citizens. We listen to experts, we study the facts surrounding an issue, we deliberate with colleagues, friends, and families, and we ultimately make up our own minds. And so this is kind of what, where we're gearing students to, right? So they get that compelling question, they've done all the work, and now finally they have the, um, all of the tools they need to answer the inquiries that they've come up with and you know, show uh, their classmates and their, and their teachers all the things that they've learned. So in our classroom, um, we had students um, um, answer formatively our compelling question, which was the same as her fourth and fifth grade classroom. Fourth and fifth grade? All right. Um, so every week they had like a task at the end of the week that they had to complete. Where it was, um, it first started with note taking, and then it got, came down to making a poster and making visuals. Um, and the other thing that um, Hadassah and I were able to do because we were able to enhance every week with this formative, with the same formative question, asking the same formative question with the resources, um, we were able to um, include one of our students that, um, that has autism. So being able to include a lot more um, um, images so that he could participate and be a part of the inquiry and the research. Um, he was able to be a part of the knowledge that was being gained by the other students. Um, and then this was one of the posters for other students and you can tell that they have a lot more uh, information on this poster. But on the next poster, this is where the transfer happened for, the other, for our other student um, that needed more supports. But the other students were still able to perform their task and a lot of it was done orally for the other students. But he was able to participate by identifying the important information on the poster. Um, doing all these and having a formative question, the final week we were able to um, kind of change the question but have the same value of the question. Um, um, we changed it to how did European explorers change Native American life? So in their summative essay, they had to um, speak on both. They had to say how they, changed, um, how they did harm and how they did good. And they had to do that, and like the argument was with themselves, which and the and then there's like a sample on the slide, and then there's a picture of the student completing um, one of the tasks before he was able to do this task. Um, so there's a few students in this classroom in particular that have um, IEP goals and reading, um, executive functioning goals. So what we did is we strategized, we took all of their IEP goals and we kind of aligned it to what they were learning in the classroom. So we implemented different graphic um, organizers. Um, this one was actually an adaptive visual sort for the student that we also implemented that kind of just correlated with the key concepts and content that was being learned throughout the lessons. Um, so we did that with a, quite a few students in this classroom and we kind of embedded it throughout the content of the whole entire unit and so those students were also that, that were higher functioning than this particular student were able to complete an essay task that you see um, on the display there and also able to um, display that in a poster form as well. So as, as we culminate the um, elementary pilot, the first elementary pilot, we would like to hear from one of our ESL teacher leaders who also collaborated with the fourth grade dual language and fourth grade monolingual to make sure that this content was linguistically accessible to all of our students. So I'm Jadia again, and we were able to take a survey of all of our teachers at the elementary level who did this TCI pilot. And um, we measured 10 different specific things, some of them being, does it have the arc of inquiry? Does it include assessment? How are the teacher resources? And how is it aligning to our standards? Is it meeting our needs specifically for our Wisconsin standards? Um, the data is right there 
for you kind of um, an average. And what we kind of figured out through the data is that teachers were so excited to have things ready to go for them as far as resources. But in the end, it, it lacked a lot of things. It lacked, um, it had heavy gaps in assessment for us and it didn't always cover the Wisconsin standards we needed. As well as sometimes the compelling questions left some big gaps that we had to do a lot of our own work to either find the, the other side of the resource or completely change the question to make it something that could be debatable. Um, so our next step after trying out that TCI resource is going to be to move to the impact resource that we are pilot to. And if you want to move to the next slide. Um, we're actually starting the pilot two at Thursday. We have a meeting to kind of introduce ourselves to it and, and jump right in. So that will happen this Thursday. And then from there, we'll go on with a scope and sequence for K to five. And then Rachel. Um, at the secondary level, um, as Jess referenced, we are going to begin developing our scope and sequence for 612. And then this summer, we'll begin to look at reviewing resources that we would be looking to pilot um, in the fall or in the winter of next year. And then as a K-12 system, we just wanted to remind you, last time we presented on this as well, that we are going to utilize our district curriculum council, which is going to continue to be revamped to make sure that we're including parents from all um, of our schools as an avenue to give us feedback around this major curricular overhaul. So that's a group that meets um, frequently throughout the year and will continue to enhance that um, curriculum council to make sure that we're getting adequate parent feedback around our process. That's it. <laughs> Questions that you have for our team? I'll, I'll start with one because this is amazingly interesting <laughs> and, and, and the capacity of it. Um, when I, I just need to grab sit here looking at the elementary level, thinking about the secondary level, I think the elementary level that you're talking about is significantly advanced to the elementary level that I think about. I mean, you are preparing, if I'm reading this correctly, you are preparing these elementary kids for significantly more education at their high school or at their senior secondary level. Am I right? I mean, they are gonna be so much better prepared than, you know, a few years ago when I was in elementary school. <laughs> Bill, you know, you're- We were just told this, 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 and this. That's the way it is, guys. Right, and Bill, you're correct. The standards have shifted incredibly to be able to support our even youngest students, not only to have an opinion, but to have an evidence-based opinion, which is a real shift, right? Um, it's consistent with how we teach comprehensive literacy as well, where students are going back into the text, back into the sources, and corroborating why they feel the way that they feel. Oh, it's because the author said it right here. Um, I do think you're right that there have been big shifts. The teacher is no longer the source of imparting information. They are the curator of resources so that students can take an interdisciplinary approach to answering questions, the approach an economist might take, a behavioral scientist might take, a political science, a historian. Not all of our compelling questions are answered yes or no. Many are answered how would an economist see this? how would the different disciplines approach this subject? So it's vastly different and vastly different expectations for elementary students specifically. And are we finding that they can, can deal with it? Are they comfortable with it? I would think so. Yeah, and I think I said this, they're set up so well with the framework in our comprehensive literacy already that they're used to having this kind of like, being able, like she said, going back into the text and having evidence for your argument, they're doing the same thing with the sources that we're putting in front of them. Thank you. Mr. Bryan. So, you know, um, I think one of the struggles we've had in society is being able to have discussions, right? Without it turning just into an emotional debate. Yeah, my strong. So I think it's good that we're trying to help children acquire school, you really 
divide between us, right? Um, so what I would say about these programs is that you know you can pick out one little thing and try to make it like it's a bad thing, but when you put it all together, it's a really cool thing. And you have to do all these things to put it all together to make it into a good thing. Um, so if you take something out of context. Um, and not put it in the context of the overall discussion and the skill set that we're trying to build in one study. So we're not trying to tell them what to think. We're trying to get them to learn how to how to interact with each other in a constructive manner, right? Correct. Okay. So I think it's great that we're doing this at the elementary level. Um, I'm going to ask one out of context question because uh, um, not too far out of context, but for each of you, how long have you been teaching and in the district? How long have you been teaching in the district and how long have you been teaching overall as a full-time educator? <laughs> well, hello, I'm Hadassah Robinson. I've been in, the, this is my fourth year here in the school district of Waukesha, um, but my ninth year overall teaching and then I have been teaching higher education um, for four years. I'm Lucia Torres. Um, I've been teaching at uh, Waukesha for four years, and this is my sixth year teaching. I'm Jadia, and I've been in Waukesha for six years, and this is my tenth year teaching. Oh, sorry. Mark has it. Mark's been holding on. Sorry, I'm, I'm definitely, a, I would never been called a quiet person, so I'm just a little, a little surprised. <laughs> Um, I'm JD. I've taught in the district for six years and as a teacher, 10. I had to think about it for a second. This is my fourth year in Waukesha as well and my 10th year overall. This is my second year in Waukesha and my second year teaching. <laughs> this is my fifth year in Waukesha and fifth year overall. And this is my 10th year in Waukesha and my 13th year overall. Do you want me to answer this too? <laughs> Uh, this is my 17th year teaching and my 17th year in Waukesha. I guess that goes pretty fast. Um, and uh, being the last one in the line here, before I give the microphone to Rachel, I do just want to say you saw some awesome stuff with the elementary um, with the elementary questions, with the elementary inquiry, and I, I see my second grade daughter talking about that stuff all the time at home. And uh, it's actually really interesting, as I look at 17 years, uh, the education that I watch and the education that I see in Waukesha today is so vastly different from the education that I saw when I started, when I thought we were hitting a home run back then. And, uh, and today I look at you know, some of those old lessons and some of those old things that our students were doing, and you, know, you compare it to today or as, as Bill said earlier, you know, um, when you know we were in elementary school about the same time, I assume. Um, so, so you know, it's just it's so vastly different. And I know that that question wasn't asked of me, and I just answered anyway. But here you go, Rachel. If you add your years to my years, then we get to Bill's years. Right? It's all the same. Yeah, I would just like to say, you know, um, the, the challenge you have in building a great school district is getting great teachers. Right? And you don't build a great school district without great teachers. And I'm glad that um, we're able to grow our own. And I'm glad that we're able to attract people to come into the program to help us build our great schools. And uh, they're all obviously great teachers, and we're glad to have you. Thank you. Mr. Como. Yeah, I can, I can guarantee you, I'm going to go back just to second grade for now. But really, all the grades that the, what you presented wasn't close to what how I learned. And I was even thinking geography. Did I know the word geography? <laughs> Second grade, you know. And um, it is like light years. And Bill, I'm glad that you you started the conversation here. Um, I did not recognize. So so I think it's natural for people to say, I went through school this way. And that must be the way school should be taught forever. That's the best way, period. Because we experienced it. And that's not the case. Things change and things can be better and things can evolve. 
And it's just really impressive, the engagement. I mean, the students being able to engage in some research and to dialogue back and forth, to use that word respectfully, <laughs> um, that was just, I, I really appreciate the examples you guys brought. It really hit home how different social studies is, at least for myself when I could compare it to what I had learned. And I can compare it to what my children had learned too, which wasn't as far back as when I was. I appreciate the examples, they were really excellent examples. Does the shift in uh, curriculum um, instruction and student engagement coincide with the new forward exam? Yes, all of the um, standards have shifted to be able to support our students to mastery in the forward exam. Um, the careful selection of an instructional resource is what we are most um, spending most of our time on right now because not all instructional resources have the scaffold or the support for the sources and for the argumentation. And as Jadia mentioned, um, we don't want to put a lot of burden on our teachers to have to go and search for the impossible to find because therein lies some of the challenge, right? Where one person might search and find one resource, another person might search and find another resource. For elementary, we're really looking to be able to take some of that guesswork out and provide them with high quality sources that have been vetted and that really support them to focus on being um, a teacher that can facilitate inquiry, conversation, questions, analysis, and then lead our students to be able to take a variety of perspectives in forming a claim that they can argue with evidence. So it, everything is very much related to the standards and we are being very, very conscientious about finding a resource that will support our teachers to the, the best ability. Very good, thank you. If I can just like speak a little bit to that, too, with having the resource in my hands this year in comparison to not. Sorry, if I can just speak to having the resource in my hands as prior, prior to this I didn't, I was more focused on finding the what and having the what allowed me to then focus my energy on the how. Like how are we gonna tackle it? Are we gonna do it in partners? Are we gonna discuss? Are we gonna note take? Are we gonna use a graphic organizer? So it was really nice to have the what so that I could focus on implementation. And I'm going to piggyback on that and say that we just, um, when we met with secondary last, um, I think Brianna and Jess will echo in the sentiments that when I shared with them, we're going to get a resource. They all like looked at me like, are you serious? Like they haven't had a resource <laughs> since we've been doing social studies. And so the fact that, to um, Stephanie's point, they don't have to be searching and creating and curating that curriculum, but they can be worrying about the compelling questions and rely on right a resource to provide them with some of that is going to be just incredibly important. So we haven't yet, again, begun to pilot or look at those resources, but that is yet to happen, and they're chomping at the bits to get that done. So. Anything else from the committee? Well done. Awesome presentation. Very full of information and very pleased and proud of the work that you're doing. So uh, continue with your efforts and we look forward to having you come back to give us uh, an update at a future meeting. Thank you so much, great job. Thank you so much. I need to stay for the next one. So. Next this evening, we have under discussion information items, we have AP Human Geography textbook adoption process, and we have Rachel Perman here once again, our director of secondary learning. back too, Rachel, which is great. What's that? I'm sorry. Back as well. Oh, yes, yes. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so someone can sit there and then, or you can just pass the mic. Whatever. Whatever. I'm not first. I'm first. Well, yeah, you, well, yeah I know you're first. So welcome, everybody. We look forward to your presentation All right. tonight. Hi, everybody. Back again. Um, so we are here tonight um, to talk to you about our AP Human Geography textbook. And with me, I have the same crew we brought last month. So Jim Nelson, Jenny Pano, Jill Anderson, and Mark Anderson. So Stacy, if you don't mind, hitting the... So um, just to, again, remind you of our process for... Um, how we came to recommend this text. We formulated a team of teachers and we had representation from each of our high schools that offers this course. So just again, as a reminder, EACHIEVE does not offer AP Human Geography. Um, we looked at the shifts that the AP College Board has made in the course. We then researched texts that were recommended by, our, by the AP College Board. So just again, as a reminder, Every AP course requires that you have a textbook attached to it. And that textbook cannot be older than 10 years. And so um, that's something that we looked at. What are the textbooks that AP recommends? And then um, we also looked at an alignment of the text that we were looking at to the SDW Mission and Vision for Social Studies. When we narrowed that down to three choices, um, which were presented to you last month, we then began to pilot those resources with our students. We were able to collect um, student feedback. I think we had over 300 responses to our survey and um, Mark Anderson is gonna share with you the responses to um, that survey. So we collected student feedback. We began to price out our options. And then as a team, we met to discuss pros and cons um, of, the, of the text. And we're now coming to you today to put forth our recommendation. So we've been busy over the last um, two months uh, doing those things. That makes it. So the textbook that we uh, would like to go with uh, in the future is the Human Geography for the AP course uh, by uh, Hildebrandt is the lead author on that textbook. You can go to the next slide. And in um, our considerations as far as, as the teacher perspective, what we liked about the textbook is that it was in a very student-friendly format where the learning objectives are clearly stated at the beginning of each module. There are nice large headings for the kids that they can make questions from. There are vocabulary boxes that the kids know, like I have to make sure I have this in my notes. And then at the end, they have like this main point summary that they can help to reflect on, like did you take the right kind of notes? Were you honing in on the right kind of material? So it really was built in a student-friendly format. Um, the readability of this textbook versus the other ones is also one that is more approachable for our students. And as we talk about wanting to um, increase the number of students that are taking AP and, that, and making AP accessible for more and more students, we felt like this is the one that would allow for a wider array of students' abilities and skills, and then we can continue with the extra scaffolding that we would need to do to help make the rest of the content um, approachable for them. And then lastly, at the end of each of the modules, there's also practice multiple choice and FRQ questions, which is what they will be test, the method that they'll be tested on in May. And so to have that consistent practice all the way through with each of the topics that we study, um, that was um, another thing that we found really beneficial to have right at the fingertips without having to go and search for it after every section. Hello again. So I'm just gonna pass this off. So here's a 
here's a quick comparison of student survey results uh, between the two um, most highly regarded texts that we that we looked at there, the uh, National Geographic one and the Hildebrandt text, which we are recommending today. You will see that the student responses are very, very, very close to one another. There was not an overwhelming uh, preference for one of the books. There was, however, an overwhelming preference of these books to what the text they currently had. And so these scores of them in and of themselves are very high. When you're asking students to rank how they like a textbook, that's kind of a loaded question because the answer is no, uh, it's a textbook, right? And so when they start giving, when they start rating things, fours and fives out of five for how much they enjoy reading a book, it shows that they actually do regard it pretty highly. Now, the thing that I want, that I believe stands out here is the graph on the right. It shows the two largest variances in, in um, I guess, in student responses were in is the book relevant and is the book engaging? And for the Hildebrandt text, that, oh, that was significantly higher than any other book we looked at. And thus, if I'm looking at two books that are both very highly regarded by the students, but yet one is more relevant and engaging, that's the one that I'm going to go with. And I just want to really quickly, I'm gonna give you one tiny passage from the book that I think um, really speaks to what the students liked about it. Because let's be fair, this is a college level textbook being given to ninth graders. You wanna talk about a jump in, um, in curriculum, you go from middle school to having this book put in front of you, and this is, this is the context. And um, I, on page 355, and you don't have to turn to it if you don't want, because it's very short. It's talking about the Berlin Conference's impact, and it's assuming, many books assume that a student would have already taken world history to the point where they just know what the Berlin Conference was. Ninth graders have not had that. The simple phrase of, to understand what the Berlin Conference hoped to achieve, we need some background information. That phrase right there was very powerful to me and to my students, and that sort of thing is found throughout the book. Here's what we have to learn about we better know some of this background information, not just take it for granted. And I think that's what a lot of my students found made it more relevant and engaging to them. And we did not put the student responses like they, um, in, the, in this data, but that was consistently referenced, the idea that it didn't just assume you already knew everything. And so that is uh, what the student responses showed us. Well, good evening. Um, going along with what Mark said, we found that the book is, is very student focused and it, it really answers questions for them. It helps them move along by anticipating the questions that they might ask and some of the things they might need to finish a question. So uh, it's very student focused. Uh, there's examples and practice for each of the modules and it's broken down into fairly short bits. So we're not overwhelming people with too much at once. And it is, a, it's written in a student friendly language and it gives them an opportunity to digest the information. Uh, I think as uh, Jill said, there are, instead of having just a list of vocabulary words, there's a box, a little box on each, each of the vocabulary words is explained in there and it's, it's outlined and it's in a, a different color than the rest of the page, so it stands out. So it's, it really helps them to, to work through things. They know what to look for. Um, it is aligned with the AP learning objectives. Um, some of the books, the current book, what we have been using is totally not. So that's, that's a big jump. Uh, this is aligned with it. It allows us to use online AP resources, like the AP Classroom, uh, which is very helpful. And um, since it is so aligned with them, it, it's, it's just really easy to follow the whole, the whole program. And if you look at the AP outline for the College Board, you can you run down it and you can just walk through this book and see everything there. Now the National Geo book does the same thing as far as that structure goes, so that's, that's plus for both of them. Uh, 
It does support AVID and gradual release of responsibility, things that we've focused on quite a bit, now, giving the students the responsibility for moving themselves forward and giving them the tools to do that. It's very, very complete in that regard. Um, and I, in talking to the students, they've, they've gotten curious about the things in there and have taken the, the initiative to move forward on their own and, and ask some good questions about things that are in the book, which I think is very helpful. It does support higher learning, uh, higher level learning where you want inquiry. Uh, they give examples of uh, specific topics with, it, with specific cities uh, in different parts of the world, depending on what the topic is. If you're talking about agriculture, you can talk about some, some feature of it in every part of the world, and it gives examples. And also prompts them to go out and look on their own. The free response questions that are in there reference what's in the book, but then prompts them to maybe find another city or another place that you can apply the same, the same thought process to. So I think that that's really good. It's not just memorizing data, it's, a, it's applying it and answering questions. And there is an online component for this. Uh, if you look on the back of the, the textbook, uh, when, when you get the opportunity, there is a list of these are the things that we have to support it. And we've looked at those that, that we've had a, uh, access to and used that as, uh, as a, a help in the decision-making process. Uh, and just to, it's not on this slide, but as far as how does this work or does it work with kids, uh, after using this book for the last module, the last unit, I gave a summative, a good-sized summative test using all AP questions from the AP College Board site, which asks you to take information and apply it to a situation you may not have heard before or seen before. And I was honestly very impressed. With, they took it very seriously. They worked on it really hard. The scores were a lot higher than I anticipated they would be. Uh, so they, they're actually able to use the information that they're getting in this book to put it into a, another scenario and through a, a logical thinking process and some higher level reasoning, able to come up with decent answers. So uh, I think that's a plus. Okay. So there is not um, a whole lot to say here, but we're, I guess I can speak for all of us that we're really excited about um, getting a new textbook. And I know we've spoken a little bit negatively about our, our current book. And um, I mean, I still remember, I think I brought up last time, learning that this was the most popular AP Human Geography textbook. So I was like, all right, we're, we're using the right book. And you know, we've come a long way. College Board has changed the curriculum. This book is, is just so perfect. And um, so we're looking forward to us um, AP Hug teachers from all three high schools to collaborate a lot. Um, obviously work a lot independently, but also come together to um, really dive into this resource and, and, and this book and all the additional resources that go with it, um, you know, to really start working over the summer, um, hopefully, um, as we prepare for the next school year. And um, we're going we're gonna to talk a lot about our units and, you know, good and bad and, and different um, bounce different ideas off of each other that we can get from this new book and collaborate. We are also going to talk about um, potentially revising our AP syllabus where we're looking at right now the, the audit process and where we're at as a school district um, with College Board and what we might need to do with this new book. Um, we're also looking to explore the, the ideas of different common assessments for each of our seven College Board units. That would be um, be a nice thing to look at and, and explore a little bit more with this new book, and then also really create um, a good plan for each of the College Board units and how we're going to use this book with our kids. and And we're just really excited. So, what's next? <clears throat> so, um, in terms of costs, right now we are in the process of pricing out our digital and hard copy options. So they do offer. Um, this book in a digital version. However, our initial student surveys have indicated that many of our students actually prefer a hard copy, which was really surprising to me, um, especially if you hold the textbook. Like, it is like a heavy textbook. Um, and so right now we're looking at what 
what we want to go with. The online textbook is no different than the hard copy. It presents the same information. And regardless of, regardless of if you purchase the hard copy or the online version, you still have access to all of the supplemental online resources. Um, both uh, so both options, again, they come with the same supplements. Um, the tentative cost for both options is right around $33,000. And so um, that's based on our current enrollment plus a little bit of a buffer um, based for uh, next year's kids who are um, enrolled to take AP Human Geography. So um, that is all we have for you in terms of, again, the excitement we have around this book. Um, and so we're wondering what questions you might have. Mr. Bromberg. Uh, Rachel, on, on the 33,000, how many is that supplying? 230. 230? And is that about where, I think you were saying that's about where we are, maybe a little bit of extra in there? Yeah, so it's it's right about where we are. I usually build in about a 15 um, fifteen kid buffer. Is it, is it going, has it, has it been climbing? Yes. Because I, for one, thought this was a pretty inter I didn't read that all I wrote pieces but it really is quite interesting as you get into it and um, uh, the other my other point was relative to the reading I really liked the readability of this one uh, particularly when I found out that this was freshmen as well as seniors so uh, you, you can't have a variation in, in readability at those between those le four levels you got but I think this one covers that part of it to my comfort. Absolutely, and, and, and I think the teachers could probably speak to this, but the course is predominantly freshmen. I think it would be a, a pr yeah, it's, it's a pretty rare occasion that you would see a sophomore, junior, or a senior in that course. There, is, is there any selectivity process that freshmen go through to get into this? Um, so there is a recommendation process that our middle school teachers use, but we do not, we're not gatekeepers. So any child who wants to take all of our high schools promote what are called stretch classes. And so any student who wants to take the course can take the course. There's not a prerequisite. Um, obviously they work with their counselors and again, their eighth grade teachers to determine if it's a good fit. You know, like many of the teachers referenced, it's a college level course that's, you know, a, a, for a freshman that can be... At least it's it's looked at. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Bryan. So, you know, back in when I went uh, engineering, I mean, we used to get a lot of criticism from our overseas students that Americans were not, there's no understanding of anything outside our country, right? I'd say to them they probably didn't understand America well, very well either, but, you know, I think by having these types of text, it's, it's very much needed for today's world because we don't have a non-moving society. Our society moves around the world, right? And there's things going on around the world or even within our own country that we need some context to. And I think this, this human geography, AP human geography, the texts I saw here were excellent. When I looked at the three books, I was really comparing when I started to look at it, I was kind of setting the one you guys haven't talked much about aside for now. <laughs> and, and I looked at the two, the National Geographic and, and the one you're recommending. And I liked the depth of what I was reading in the National Geographic one. I liked the ease of readability in the Human Geography one. Um, so it, for me, it was a tough call. Was that just because this was easier to read that I was liking it better than the one that I felt had more depth? So, uh, of course, I'm not the one who has to make sure you pass the AP course. So at the end of the day, um, we have to pick the right text relying on you guys. And I had no problems with either one. And, and, and I did have problems with the third one. I wasn't really very comfortable with that one. Um, when I look at the topics covered in these books, um, they're very relevant topics for today. They're very current. Um, I'm looking at topics about uh, biodiesel, you know, the, and critical conversations around that. Um, you know, all this stuff is stuff that um, will help us better understand topics that we, that our, 
that we as a society are encountering today. So I, I thought both books covered it well. Um, for a guy with uh, eyes that are getting a little older, obviously this one was a little bit easier than the other <laughs> one. But I really like the depth of the other one too. But if you're, if you're getting the content uh, t at the level needed to explore fur further if necessary, and to meet the sequence and content of the AP program, I saw nothing wrong with uh, the human geography, the Hildebrandt book, myself. I also want to say that um, my 84-year-old mother-in-law, she came to visit and she saw these books laying out and she could not take her, she was like in these books, <laughs> it was like, and I think that's one of the problems we have with our, with, our, with our community. I'd like our community to know what we're really actually teaching in our schools. And because if they knew that, I think they'd be less willing to just assume the negative because the positive is extremely positive. And I, I, I wish there was a way we could get that across. I guess we're relying on our children and the parents, but I mean, we need to also get it across to the grandparents and, and the rest of it. And I'm not quite sure how we do that. Anything else? Mr. Como. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's impossible, obviously, to read huge amounts of so I chose a couple things that I thought I could handle and that were uh, relevant to um, just some things that we've gone through. And, and I chose on page 364 the module that deals with internal political boundaries. And uh, that moves on to the module of forms of, of, of governance. And, you know, I can see how the students, when they're looking at this book, how they might want to have the hard copy. Because one of the things on page 368 that I found very fascinating, um, and, and to Mark's point too, I'll, I'll just take a step back. When Mark was saying there's some nice background information that kind of leads them into it. And then there's some really strong transitional too. So I'm looking at page 369 where it's 29-2, just below that. Now that we understand how political boundaries can shape voting outcomes, let's consider how voting results can reveal regional differences. And that's, that's a really powerful thing to, to explore. Um, one of the first questions I have is, did anyone pilot either of these modules? Just not probably these, not. not these but by the time we got to this point, we, we were past some of this. That's okay. Right. Th this book was not pub was not actually published until like a month ago. January 18th. <laughs> yeah, right. And so we had gone beyond the political. Sure. That's fine. That's fine. I was just curious. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that they're bringing up is is if you look at you know uh, the the illustration 29.6 where it, it, divide, it shows the results from uh, you know, who voted for Trump and who voted for Clinton, uh, Republican versus Democrat. We have two parties in, you know, in, in our uh, great country. And um, what, what, what's really interesting is this is the graph that you always see on the news. And there were if you turn the page and you look at the next graph and then the following graph, the next one, they're trying to show that there's, that that was a really simple graph that we see day in and day out that really gives us just kind of an introduction to, to this. And that if you take population, uh, for example, into consideration, you got that 3D graph. Wow, that it, it just presents a whole different flavor to it, or the, the, the 29.8, purple America, where, you know, it's not just you're either blue or you're red, there's, you know, there's people in the middle, you know, and there's people who, you know, are moderates and kind of, in some cases, they lean more conservative, in other cases, they lean more liberal, and it depends on the topic, and, and I just thought that the graphs and the illustrations that I had witnessed were very powerful, and I could see how the kids would want to be flipping back and forth, being able to do you know some comparisons um, to 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 really understand 
what's you know um, the, the, how things can be um, interpreted differently by different forms of graphs um, and and other not just the graphs here but um, the readability to to your points and to Bill I thought it, it was for, for ninth graders I think it's it's going to be super challenging but understandable they can do it they can work with this and uh, I was pretty I was pretty excited now so I like the examples that I read um, I thought it was factual and, and neutral it wasn't trying to persuade you know you to lean one way or another it was let's just talk about the facts and that's I really I really liked that but s since you know we only have a few days to really read and look at these things there's some really there's been some parents who have come to me with some tough questions and um, there's some some um, there's some topics out there that I just need to ask some questions on. And it really focuses into in, um, getting people comfortable with what we're teaching. You know, it's, it's, to your point, you know, Kurt, you know, there's a lot of good information here, but our parents aren't seeing this right now. They haven't had, you know, weeks to look at this like we have and months and years for you guys to kind of get to, to, to this point, and you guys are very comfortable with it. But, you know, so we have things like critical race theory. We have BLM. We have the Me Too movement. We have white supremacism. We have all these things that our parents are worried about that, you know, we're concerned. What is this material? So can you, can you address your comfort level and can you address that aspect? You know, is it, Certainly. Teaching them that stuff? Not what the kids are going to be learning is, you know? Yeah, so. Oh. Can, I, can I take that one? <laughs> Please. Right. Um, I actually, I kind of anticipated this question a little bit. So I, I already had bookmarked uh, pages uh, 638 and, and 639. Um, because that's the relevant pages for a question like that. I think one thing that's really important to know about human geography is that um, human geography is dealing with where are people located, why are they located there, and how does the diffusion of peoples happen. That's one of the big, it's not about what are all of the movements that are happening today. It is not what is all, what are all of the historical arguments that have happened. It is, when I look at my community, why do certain people live in certain places? When I look at the world, why do certain people live in certain places? And what are their experiences? You referenced the gerrymandering in Wisconsin section, okay? Now that's looking at, that's still geography. It's looking at boundaries and different way of looking at boundaries, right? So in a human geography class, does it talk about some of the uh, problems that the country has had in the past with race. It does, because let's be fair, we have had some racist problems in this country that have dictated where people live. And those things, you know, when we look at where do different ethnic groups live, where do different races of people live within America, and why do they live there, some of those historical lessons do show up in there. You know, and I guess I'm mostly referencing slavery, right? And uh, and so are we spending weeks talking about all of the different movements and all that stuff? No, I think race in America is probably about 30 minutes of one day in a class like this. Because remember, this is a test that would be taken by people throughout the world, not just the United States of America. So this is not an America-focused class. And thus, a lot of those arguments, a lot of those um, discussions don't necessarily happen in I'm going to add on to what Mark shared in that um, everything that we teach, everything that's connected to this course is aligned to the AP College Board's curriculum. And that has been created and vetted by those professionals. And so you heard the group, right, talk about this is a textbook that has not only been sponsored by the AP College Board, but that is aligned to that curriculum. 
And so that's where we start, right? Is this a, is this a resource that aligns to the curriculum and the topics that the College Board requires that we would instruct upon? Some of those topics that you mentioned, I can assure you, are no part of the AP Human Geography course curriculum. So we wouldn't see them in this course. Um, the second piece is we consistently are looking at best pedagogy. And so you heard in the social studies um, update them talking about this idea of an inquiry-based approach and compelling questions. And there are most certainly topics within any textbook or within any social studies curriculum that someone might deem to be controversial. With that said, our goal is to consistently be able to rely on both our process for how that piece of curriculum got in front of students. So right, was it vetted by a group of professionals? Does it align to standards? Is it age appropriate? Did we follow our supplemental resource policy that was adopted by the board, right? We go through all of that before we put anything in front of kids. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna be void of controversy. We might have controversy. But we welcome that because discord is sometimes an agent to change, right? Discord is sometimes gonna make us better as educators. Um, the last piece is we look at the students in front of us. And I think, again, the topics you mentioned are not topics that you would see covered in an AP Human Geography class, but what you will see covered and what is definitely a central theme is this idea of moving away from a single storyline. So what we want to continue to do is make sure that the diverse student body that we serve is also represented in the text in which they are reading. And so if you look back at the student survey results, and I don't know if Stacy, you can click back to those, but one of the questions that we asked them was around, do you see yourself in the text? Because we know what we know that that engages kids when they can connect themselves to the curriculum that they're engaging in. And if we look at the scores for diversity, which is, I believe, and I don't have my glasses on, the red bar, correct? Um, I mean, the green. We're almost at a four, and five was the highest. And so that piece, again, are we talking about Black Lives Matter? No. But are we talking about multiple stories? of different people's experiences within the world? Yes. And, and if I may, too, this, this goes along nicely with the presentation that we just had on, on social studies, because these kids that take this class, they are some sharp kids. Like, you converse with some of these people, and I, I'm like, my main goal here is to try to be smarter than you, because <laughs> you might be a ninth grader, but you are incredible. And uh, so they see the world around them. They see what's happening, and they make connections to what they are reading. So are some of those issues going to be brought up by student connections? Most certainly. And, and I welcome that, because sometimes that's, you know, that's the best place for them to kind of start fleshing out ideas and inquiring about things that they have heard and, and stuff like that. I think one of the most common things that uh, I hear from students is, Mr. Anderson, this, uh, this human geography class, it's, it's ruined, it ruined my vacation. Well, why? Well, I, we went to Whole Foods, and I was just starting to wonder how that affected the property values around this place. <laughs> and, uh, and, they're, and they're like making these sorts of connections. So you never know what direction a conversation might go once they start reading something. But I think I, you hit, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I, was, I just really appreciate it. Um, you know, these are the kinds of questions we do get from our parents, right? Uh, as board members. Absolutely. And there is not just like this little one minute answer you can just say, you know, and have ready. Um, it, it's, it's complex. We live in a complex world. And we need to be able to engage the students with relevant information. And, you know, we live in a diverse nation. This is a great nation. Our diversity is great. And, and we should celebrate that. And we need to learn to be able to s s study in, in, in within that, that realm. And you know, I really do appreciate the thought that you put into your answers here. And, and I look forward as we continue to develop curriculum and choose, choose uh, textbooks, 
uh, yes, whether students like them or not, but uh, uh, it was really impressive to actually see some of the scores, to see that the kids were really engaged with the, with the textbook, because I know I wasn't necessarily one of those students that liked reading the textbook. Some of the supplemental stuff I found way more, way more interesting, but um, I, I appreciate you taking on that tough topic um, and one that's relevant to our society right now. Mr. O'Brien. So what children are learning in school is about as old as time itself, ever since we've had public education. And uh, I remember when um, I lived out in a very rural area, so we had world book encyclopedias and childcraft, right? You know, if, if you could read, which I could, there was a wealth of new knowledge for me in childcraft, childcraft and world book encyclopedias. And nobody said that what was in childcraft was bad or what in world books encyclopedias was bad. It was just knowledge that whenever we had a question in our family, we'd pull out the encyclopedia, pull it off the shelf and read what you could find out in the encyclopedia. Um, I also know that when I was in elementary school, uh, there were books in the library about John F. Kennedy and one, da one daughter of one of the parents made her take it back to school because he was a Republican and he didn't want to read anything about John F. Kennedy. I mean, it's as old as time. Um, but you're right about the, the children being advanced. I mean, um, obviously running for office, uh, you get a lot of questions. And, um, and there are questions that you're struggling to answer because they just don't, you can't put them together in your mind. And I, I'm not even gonna repeat the question because it was kind of an odd question about what we're teaching children in third grade. So I asked my daughter, who's a, uh, she's, she's an educator, and she said, Dad, how in the world would you design a lesson plan for that? <laughs> and you know, if you think about it that way, it makes no sense. But what's being put in front of people is um, short sound bites without depth of analysis relative to those short sound bites. Because that's the nature of the media today that a lot of people absorb. So this is the depth, right? And that's why I would love to have people invite people. I mean, I went up, walked up to somebody and they started asking me questions. I said, boy, I wish I could bring those t these textbooks up there and lay them on his table so he could actually see what we're teaching in our schools today. Um, and why we need to teach it. Because it's a different world. It's, it's a different world than I grew up in. I mean, I, when I was a kid, we were worried about how fast we could get under our desk in case of a nuclear attack, you know? <laughs> Holy, no kids worry about that today. I mean, it's, it's a whole different game, so. Ms. Roddy. Yes, thank you. Um, as I started skimming through this, now this happens to be a topic that I really enjoy, so I was a little bit nerdy about reading this and I was excited, but um, as I started skimming through them, uh, my mind kind of switched. I was like, how am I going to select this? What qualifies me to select these things? So I had to put it in terms that my mind could put it, wrap itself around. So I looked at the text as being the vision. This is what we want the, the students to be able to take in. And I looked at the syllabus as the mission. This is how we're going to get there. So I actually did, I read word for word what's in the syllabus. Is this what's currently used, this syllabus? Yes? Correct. Okay. And um, you mentioned that it, it's possible that this will be changed um, depending as you go along, correct? Correct. Okay. So as I was reading the text, um, all three I thought would spark great conversation, um, but I kind of switched my um, thinking to the readability, the cosmetics of it, the ratio of pictures to words, how, you know, um, those types of things. I'm a visual learner, so I like the graphs and things like that, so I, could, I appreciated that. I agree with uh, Mr. Como, and he says if the information is presented in a factual way, um, giving multiple perspectives on the t different topics. Um, but like I said, I focus more on the syllabus because I like, as I read through what was going to be done with each unit, it, the activities were engaging, they promoted dialogue, um, explained how the students would be evaluated on their um, information, it allowed for critical thinking and independent thinking. Um, realizing, it gave activities to show 
that the students could realize that they all had their own realities and um, experiences in the world, but it allowed them to also come together and share those and find the commonalities and see whether or not what's happening today, um, how that's either repeated itself from, his, uh, from the past or if it is something new. Um, so I appreciate how you put together the, um, the syllabus to apply what's, going, what's coming out of these. And I think I even marked one of the sections saying I want to sit in on this class <laughs> um, because <laughs> I want to see what the students come up with. So those are some of the things that I um, considered and, and thought about as I looked through your syllabus and the textbooks. But um, I do have a star and I did pick the same book you did, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Anything else? I just want to thank you very much for all your hard work, the presentation, and also for uh, engaging us by letting us look at the textbooks. I think that was uh, really helpful for me and my fellow board members to actually have hands-on experience with what uh, you were talking about, and it, it engaged us and brought us along in the process, which I think was very helpful um, to us as well to understand what was being presented. So. Uh, great job and uh, continue um, success to all of you and uh, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want the books back? Um, if you just leave them, we'll collect them okay, at the end. Okay, just leave them at our desk. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, sounds good. That'll be five less you have to order. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Our last uh, discussion information item this evening is uh, an update on our winter map data. And we have uh, Amy Rebel here tonight, our data communication liaison, here uh, for the presentation of that information. Welcome, Amy. our students again um, and so I have a lot of new numbers for you so um, just as a reminder MAP is an online assessment it's a computer adaptive assessment so um, students get a question based on how they answered the previous questions we test our students in reading and math in grades kindergarten through eighth grade we do have a few high school students who test based on um, a particular program or something they're working on. Um, but for the most part, we look at kindergarten through eighth grade in math and then second grade through eighth grade in reading. Students get a RIT score, which is that um, equal interval measure that I talked about. Think about that yardstick again and, and those measurements. And we look to measure both student achievement and their growth. So we're looking at progress over time. It's also a nationally normed test, so we can determine how our students did compared to other students across the nation who also took the MAP test. And I know last time I was here, we talked about remote administration. So um, students were able to take this if they were um, learning virtually for the first time in the fall. And um, in the winter, we were able to test more of those students participating virtually as well as our eAchieve students. So um, this round of testing has more students in it than it had last time. So I have a bunch of numbers, like I said. Um, last time when I was here, it had been a while since we'd been able to test all of our students in MAP. So we looked at kind of the history over the last several years to kind of build a context of that fall score, kind of being a new baseline since it had been a while. And it was the first time that we were testing all of our students three times a year. Um, so this time, I am not going to give you those years of history. I'm merely going to give you fall 2020, which was this past fall when we tested in September and October and November. And then this winter when we tested in January and February. So um, you're just, we're just gonna look at the change from those two. Again, we did test more students. Also, um, just know that when I went in and started um, 
analyzing this data, we found a few tests from fall that had come in late. So I added those in. So um, you might see a little bit of a change, nothing dramatic since the last time we tested, but just want you to know if you go back and look at the previous report and you're like, hmm, that's a half a percentile different. It's because it's a bit of a moving target this year as we, as we test. And I would rather add those scores late than not include them. So we're going to look at four different points tonight. The first one being the one I think is the most important. Um, and I think Jody agrees that this is the one we look at the most, and that is projected proficiency. How are students in MAP are projected to do on the Wisconsin Forward exam, which is our state assessment, of course. Um, and that's based on some calculations and some history, some historical study that MAP has done. And then I'm also going to give you scores for um, how our students did for scoring at or above the 50th percentile nationally. Of course, the 50th percentile being um, the average score um, across the nation. We're going to look at students scoring below the 25th percentile. So those are the students in the, in the bottom quartile, and we ask all of our schools to pay particular attention to those students. They look at all the scores. But we want, as a school, as a system, to look at those students scoring below the 25th percentile to determine um, what additional needs there might be, what intervention um, or additional supports might need to be in place. And then we're going to look at students meeting the fall to winter growth target. So every student, based on how they scored in fall, gets a target for the winter. And that's based on how students, wherever that student scored in the fall, how across the nation kids at that same score, what they typically grow. So it's, it's comparing them to other kids across the nation. So if, a, if, a, if students typically move from a 200 in fall to a 205 in winter, then that 205 is the growth target. And we measure um, the number, percentage of students who meet that or exceed that target, whatever the target is. And it's different for every student who, um, and every different, different RIT score across, across the band. So we just look at, did they make that target? Did they exceed it? If they exceeded it, they met it, and we count it. So those are the four things we're going to look at tonight. So here we go. Um, and you have a paper copy in front of you because I know this is small to like, I can't see that far away. Um, <laughs> Uh, my bifocal contacts don't work out there. Um, I also have data for you in um, some different subgroups. So um, every chart's going to be set up the same way. So we'll walk through what, um, what this looks like. Um, you have across the top, the diff we have all students. And then we have four different subgroups that we're looking at. So our students who identify as white, our students who identify as Hispanic, our students who identify as black, and our students with IEPs, so our students participating in special education. So we have um, percentages for each of those. And then I have grade bands together. So fall on top, winter below. So that fir those first two rows are all about our second graders and um, how they did in the fall for that subgroup and how they did in the winter. And this is projected proficiency, so the percent of students projected to be proficient on forward for the reading test or the English language arts test, they call it. So for example, overall, our second grade students in the fall, 43.7% of them were projected to be proficient. In the winter, 51% of them were projected to be proficient. We've got third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade all on this elementary chart. I have a second chart on the next page that looks at middle school. Now there's the middle school version set up the same way with the same subgroups, just sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Percentage of them projected to be proficient. These aren't our students' scores. These are projected by MAP or our colleagues. These are our students. And so, for example, uh, in the top left corner here, in the top corner here, 44.3% of all of our students who tested in the sixth grade in the fall, uh, MAP said, based on their scores, we see 44.3% of them are, will be proficient. 
that's our projection. Now they, ha they have to put the same amount of effort on the forward exam that they put on the map test, um, but that's, that's their projections. From so. the student score, they project how well you'll do. Yep, yep. They have done an intense study of multiple years now of forward, and if a kid was proficient on the forward exam, what score did they get in the fall, in the winter, and on, in the spring on the map test at each grade level? So they've analyzed all that. So they're looking at Wisconsin students and how they, how they did. On the next pages, then, we have the same type of projection, but just for math. And again, the chart is set up the same way. What would be nice on this chart is to have the weighting, you know, of the subgroups, I guess. Oh, you can yes. kind of see it by just looking at the all students number that obviously the heaviest subgroup we have is the, all, is the white students. But uh, the... So, so I, can, I can tell you just um, white students across our district um, is about 63% of our student population. Hispanic is about 23%. Um, students identifying as black is 5.5%. And we have about 15% of our students with IEPs. And let's say our, our, in the elementary level, our highest density of black students is maybe at one or two elementary schools, right? Exactly. Our highest density of black students or ratio of black students is at one or two elementary schools in the district, right? Um, or four? Potentially, I'd have to confirm that. I would say that there's, it's more spread out than I think we think it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There might I think, be. I think, I think uh, Joe, Ms. Landish is trying to correct me, so I, it, you're saying it's much more spread out than that. Yeah. So, but I will say that in some of these categories that is something to be aware of that where all the all student category might be 800 and some students the students in the students identifying as white category might be 600 then you know it gets smaller as you go so you're there are some relative differences in the size of the subgroup so a few students making a change or adding a few students to the group from time to time can can sway the data a little bit. Something to be aware of. So the swing in data, let's say if you're a smaller subgroup, it's, you know, one, um, it could be bigger because there's some kids could advance quite a bit. Then Correct. if you had a bigger group, it's harder for a few kids to swing the delta, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, the more students you have, the, the less change in percentage you're going to see. Um, Whereas a few students can make a big difference in a smaller group. Yeah, that does make a difference. Because we can see our, in this case, our black students are showing a, de a, a little bit different delta than the other students. Yes. Say, on this particular chart. Middle school projected proficiency. our best guess of how our students will perform on the forward exam at this point in time and they will be they are taking that now I should say started just recently so moving on then the next set of graphs shows the percent of students at or above that 50th percentile of course that 50th percentile again being the um, average nationally So we look to see that at least 50% of our students are at or above the 50th percentile. And we would like it to be even more. So Dr. Siever, we're about, 
We're about eight to ten weeks in the full face to face for all grade levels. Started January twenty fifth, so closer to ten. Yeah, some some students tested before coming back face to face, and some students tested after. So, because this was right, we started this coming back from winter break, and went until mid February for most students. So. Uh, so if we did some catch up through those 10 weeks, we're gonna see it in the forward exams probably themselves, right? We'll see it there and we'll see it in the spring math assessment. And we're working to catch up, aren't we? Yeah, okay. So you have similar charts for reading and for math for the students at or above the 50th percentile. both elementary and middle. I don't want to rush you, I know it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to look at. Next chart, if you're ready for me to move on, it's the percent of students, next set of charts, I should say, it's the percent of students scoring below the 50th, or excuse me, the 25th percentile um, for both reading and math. And again, we pay particular attention to that um, metric to identify potentially any students who um, may be in need of more support, need intervention, um, Again, we, and I, you've heard me say this before, we don't make any high stakes decisions based on just one piece of information. So if a school um, notices that a student scored below the 25th percentile, they're gonna look at the history. Um, they're gonna see if this is an, an anomaly or something that's been going on. They're gonna look at um, student attendance, engagement, those kinds of things, um, other data sources that they have in the school and um, make some decisions about what the student needs like to see this number obviously of 25 percent. There for both reading and math, elementary and middle. Ms. Rabel. Yes. Can you please list again what you just said? What, what are the areas that you look at if a student happens to fall under this percentage? Uh, each school, their um, student services team works with their teacher teams to, to take a look. Um, some of the things that they do look at, they're going to look at um, past history, you know, um, especially a student who's been in school for a while. We have a number of MAP tests, um, whether this is an anomaly or um, a pattern. Um, they're going to look at attendance how the student's engaging in class, other supports that the student's already receiving. They would be looking at some classroom work, other classroom assessments that the, the teacher might have, what the teacher's observed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. No problem. Sometimes, yes. Just the amount of time the student uh, takes to complete the test, because if you finish that test in 15 minutes, I can pretty much guarantee you what your score is going to be. And MAP has gotten smarter with that in the last couple of years. They have um, a slowdown feature that if you click too quickly, it's going to stop you, and your teacher has to put in a code and have a conversation with you. So um, they, have, they have gotten wise <laughs> to that. Um, yeah, because we do want students to take their time and do their best. So. It'd be like missing a three throw and make everybody run laps when they get, when that happens. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so 
But sometimes we do say, you know, maybe today isn't the day to test, you know, let's take a break, try and try again another day. And much prefer that to having, getting a score and then realizing, oh, maybe the student needs to redo it. It's a much more respectful use of the student's time if we just say, you know what, not today, we'll try again tomorrow. Get our most accurate score. So then the next set of charts, again, I don't want to rush you, but I, I know there's a, a lot here. <laughs> and you've been sitting for a long time, um, is the percent of students meeting that growth projection from fall to winter. So again, every student gets a projection based on how they scored in the fall, and that projection is a mathematical calculation based on how other students across the nation with that same score typically do. Um, so if you made that typical growth, you're counted in this projection as meeting or exceeding your growth target. So um, younger students typically have more to grow. They make strong, larger leaps than older students. They have um, less room to grow and so smaller increments. So your growth target might only be three or four um, RIT points. It might be 10, it just depends. And we can get a projection for each window to the next window also measure growth fall to fall, winter to winter, or spring to spring. Many ways to measure it. So right now we're just looking at fall to winter. So these are the percentage of kids who met that target. We always say that we want 100% of our kids to meet that growth target, and MAP tells us statistically that's not possible. So that's not going to happen. Um, we still want 100%. Um, but 60 to 70 percent is what MAP says is typical in a school. Or is a, not even typical, is if, if you're making that, you're doing a good job. Amy, could you give me some examples of what uh, teachers do to include students in that process as far as educating them on what their um, growth targets would be? Yeah, so we have a number of teachers who um, I have seen do some really nice conferencing with kids before and after and talking about um, their growth um, and finding a nice balance of not overemphasizing it but giving it its due you know, respect and like what, what can you do? I've seen some, um, some goal setting um, around that for students so they kind of know like privately this is what my target is and what I can do to, you know, what I'm doing in my daily academic work to, to get there and um, then celebrate or look at that success afterwards. So, and the score will come up on the screen as the soon as the student's done so they can see what their what their immediate RIT score is. So, um, so yeah, I've definitely seen some conferences. I've seen um, you know, some private charting. You know, there's a nice profile report that um, s teachers can share with students. Um, they don't always do that, just depending on the age of the student and, and kind of what they're working on, but that option is available. So, um, you know, again, finding that balance, I think, is, is really important, but we have some teachers who do a nice job with that. Yeah, Amy, thank you, Amy. Um, so you just gave some great examples of how teachers and individual students can utilize this. Um, what do we do when we look at these data um, at a district level? How do we look at it and how do we use it? So um, we have, this, this data is fresh, so Jody just got this last week. Um, so we, um, but do take a look at this. Um, Jody and Dr. Siebert and I will sit down and look at it. Um, our director team will take a look at it and use it to inform our, our work. Um, and then our school teams use it quite a bit. So, um, it definitely is a part of informing our district goals and our theory of action with the, with the sale process, both at the school and the district level. Yeah, our work is, it's broad, it, right? It is, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's the over arching umbrella of, of how we move, how we move forward. So um, I, I would appreciate um, 
perhaps maybe at the end of the year, when um, we get through an entire year, understanding how maybe these data, uh, how, how, how it impacted you and what changes we may be, be looking at as, as a district as a whole. Um, I think it's, it's one thing to look at the data, but to try and understand how it influences us as leaders to make changes. Nice to, to have an understand of that. And, and not just map, but you know, there's a, a, a lot of pieces of information that you use to make those kinds of broad changes, high level changes that impact us, whether it be in programs or uh, in a variety of ways. Um, so as we make changes, you know, what, what was the data that was used to get you to that point to say, hey, we, we needed to do something different here because of this. Those kinds of things I think would be really good at that very high level. That I think, um, thank you, yes, I'll, aff I affirm that and make a note of that. I know I, you guys are doing this all the time. Sure, that's sure. Your, that's your job. Yep. And I think what I'm trying to get at is how, can we reveal some of that? Absolutely. You know, what, do, what does that inner workings look like? Because I, I think that's underappreciated, honestly. Yeah. And we, I didn't set you up for this, but thank you for setting us up for sort of previewing our work this spring and into the summer. And we certainly want to engage the board in this conversation around what we're looking at at a macro level in terms of our district performance indicators. Okay. And so MAP is a school performance indicator that we will look forward to consistently reporting out on, okay. um, both from a school dashboard perspective, as well as Amy's giving you the overall district perspective. So MAP is just one student achievement indicator upon which we will bring to the board and have conversations around so that you can get the overall picture of student achievement according to the performance indicators that we're focusing on. So. Uh, we look forward to the spring, like I said, and into the summer, engaging the board in conversations about what our draft looks like so that we can set up consistent performance indicators to report out on, both at a, at a monthly basis as well as annually for the board and our community um, to be transparent. So, Excellent. Look, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, you know... I think everyone knows that there is an impact on our scores from COVID. I mean, there's a challenge both for the students and the educators um, throughout the year. Uh, one was hybrid and the other one was quarantines, right? Those types of things have an impact. Um, I would say if I'm, I guess I'd ask Dr. Sievert this, it seems like our quarantines have significantly dropped off. I haven't looked at the, I mean, this is how much they dropped off. I haven't looked at the charts in about four weeks now, where I used to work at, look at them every day. I mean, am I right? Because I haven't looked at the charts in four weeks. Yeah, the, the number of uh, quarantines uh, and the number of sick kids has gone way, way down. Um, mirroring, I think, where we were at about the second week of school. Okay, yeah. And... Uh, the second week of school means that we didn't have, for whatever reason, it wasn't November. We'll just say it wasn't November. Yeah. And when we look at MAP scores, it might have been pretty heavily impacted by that no November disruption, right? When we were getting hit with lots of quarantines in the elementary level. And, and you know, not that we did anything wrong, but that's just, that's, that was just a sequence of events that happened. And uh, I would say that, you know, if you have that much disruption in your system, it's very hard to educate children, right? But with the decision we made in, uh, to go full face-to-face -face, being timed right in my mind and the ability to, to, with some changes in what we're doing across the community, it seems like we're on the path to a more reasonable educational environment since we went back full face-to-face -face with less quarantines. Is that correct? Yeah, consistency in a child's education is extremely important. And, and the disruptions that happened last spring, plus the uncertainty that happened in October, November, December, you know, certainly were disruptions to that learning. 
So, you know, when we talk about the decision to go back full to face to face, I think I had a conversation with Ms. Landish before we made that decision. And she said that one of the reasons for going back full face to face was looking at our test, or, test scores, feeling that we could recover if we could get back full face to face safely, that we'd be able to, to have a chance of recovering. But without getting back full to face to face, it would be very difficult to recover. She didn't quite use those words, but somewhat like that, right? Was that correct, Ms. Landish? So now we're back full face to face, quarantines are down. We're working on proving we can, we can recover. Um, that's not gonna be an overnight success. And we do have uh, contingency plans um, that might involve the summer, right? Is that what we're saying? Okay. Wanna know the numbers? They're pretty twinky. 10, ten isolated students, 17 quarantined. Yeah. Zero staff isolated in six quarantined right now. I mean, that changes. Changes everything. Yep. It changes everything and it also changes everything that we got our staff vaccinated, you know, and they were getting themselves vaccinated as best they could too, which I, I think, you know, it's great that they were able to, I think almost a third of our staff was, I, maybe it's a bigger, maybe it's not quite that big of a number, but we were, we were very fortunate that our staff was able to try and get vaccinated on their own in addition to us trying to expedite it too. So um, yeah, staff to staff transmission or staff to child transmission or whatever could cause an issue is significantly reduced when we have our teachers vaccinated. And, and I just have some next steps, those listed on the screen, those are things that we continue to do. Um, teachers continue to look at this data, teacher teams look at this data, school teams look at this data, we look at this um, data and we'll continue to do that when our spring results come in at the very end of the school year. We expect to see continued growth. That's all I have unless you have questions. I know that's a lot of numbers, so you have things to <laughs> Things to look at later when you go home, but <laughs> if you have any questions, you know where to find me, so. Amy, remind me how uh, parents find out about these results. So often they are um, shared at conferences. Some schools do send home a paper copy and then it's always uploaded in Infinite Campus to the parent portal so they can find it there. Um, so yeah. And they can always call their school or call us and we'll provide a copy as well if they, if they need it. But typically parents find it in the parent portal on Infinite Campus. And typically that charts kids over time. I mean, it from does. the first time they took it. It does. Throughout the years. Yep, it'll have, just, for most kids, it'll have every time they've taken a MAP test. Right. Um, as I've noticed as they get to 10th, 11th grade, some of them start to fall off because there just isn't room anymore. But now that we've been doing it for 10 plus years, but yeah. So that's just another piece, not only the teacher can share targets and growth, but that can be a discussion at home as well. Definitely. Yep. And that, I think we've seen that just naturally increase with our students who are participating virtually, because um, especially at elementary, really a parent has to help them get started. So it's kind of naturally um, gotten them more involved in the MAP process too. So. Anything else for Amy? I'll be back. Sounds good. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Okay. That concludes discussion information items. Other business that we should consider for future committee meetings? Seeing none. Um, good meeting tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for your involvement and participation. Really appreciate that. Um, meeting is now adjourned. Our next teaching and learning committee meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, May 4th at 6 p.m. here in the boardroom, already into May. Um, and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in.